we're going to get really, really radical again here. Here comes an extremist statement. Obey the goddamn law. Signify straight up your willingness to do things in a not unilateral way, which is an absolutely criminal way. It says we will not be bound by law other than when it's convenient to us. We'll oppose it on others, but we're not constrained by it. We'll set our own course. The law be damned. You got an attorney general that's just been appointed and said the Geneva Conventions are obsolete, at least in terms of U.S. practice. No law will bind the United States. You're going to have to say the exact opposite. You're going to have to practice that. You're going to have to adhere to the law. Actually, this piece in the end ends up being a call for law enforcement. And it, the citizenry of the United States is going to have to be the enforcing entity. You're going to have to get your government on a leash, enforce its compliance with the fundamental rules of international law, the laws of war, human rights law, humanitarian law, and oh, by the way, the Constitution of the United States itself might be a nice thing to adhere to. And that's what drives them craziest, because this is the whole rank and file of those that say we need another 100,000 or 200,000 or 900,000 cops in the street. We need to double the number of prison beds. We need to get tough on crime. That by an entity that refuses the rule of law as a matter of policy pronouncement to the applause of the citizenry. And as long as that's the case, you can expect 911 to happen again and again and again as often as they could make it happen. And how could it be any other way? Law enforcement, adherence to law. Now there's a radical proposition. I should probably be lynched for that one, don't you think? Actually, on the issue, they're not talking about this much anymore. You've got a little boilerplate out there. Now, instead of saying all the victims, I demonized all the victims and called them Eichmanns, he said, well, he called some of them. They don't say I justify. They don't say I advocate. They sure as hell don't want to talk about the legal end of things. But we really, really don't want this guy talking. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, let's stop talking about what he said and start talking about him. Many of you have heard it. Is he or is he not Andy? <laughs> Profound schizophrenia here. I've had about 6,000 emails since this thing started. This is really fun wading through. Okay, about two-thirds of them are hostile, but they're organized hostile. They consist of about one line apiece. Okay, and you can divide them up almost equally. Sometimes it's the same person sending the emails. All right, one half of the ones that take this form go to this. He's a fraud. He's an imposter. He misrepresented himself. He's not an Indian. Now note, this is exclusively white people saying this. There's about four exceptions that I know of. It's a torrent of white people who are undoubtedly absolutely concerned with the rights and integrity of indigenous peoples. They're absolutely devoted to protecting native peoples from me passing myself off as being one and saving them from, oh, well, if somebody comes up with a what that's supposed to be there, you let me know because I haven't figured that one out. But what strikes me as bizarre, extremely interesting, Revealing of an utterly deformed self-concept is that this crew can think of nothing worse to call me than a white man. And they're all white men. <laughs> Figure out what you're going to do with that one. The other side takes the exact opposite to be true. Like I said, the schizophrenia enters in because often it's the same people. First, they accuse me of being a poser, masquerading as an Indian for all the benefits you get out of that. Ask the people on the reservations about the benefits that accrue to being an Indian. OK, this is utterly idiotic on its face. But then they turn around. Well, it's kind of like this. I liken it, the effect that's occurred here, to having this gigantic boil that's gone untreated for six or eight months. And I mean, it's just an inflamed gooey mess. 
It's like an overinflated basketball. It wants desperately to burst, but it can't on its own. So someone comes around and lances it, and you get this spray of pus. Hey, shitting bull. That's a good start. How are you and your squaw going to live through the night? I got called buckwheat for the first time. Confused their racial venom. Okay? Seen one wog, seen them all. But the pervasive thing, and again, I feel absolutely validated in assessment of the public sensibility, if you will. Shivington should have finished the job. You know who Shivington was? Probably not. He was the Methodist minister come volunteer cavalry colonel who went into Sand Creek, a non-combatant village in southern Colorado in November of 1864, issuing his troops the instructions before they went in. Remember, boys, kill all, big and little. Nits make lice. Now, for those of you not conversant with biology sufficiently to realize what those terms mean, a nit is a baby louse. You kill the babies, too, because the babies will be growing up to be adults. You exterminate them all. And they killed everything they could find. Shivington should have finished the job, meaning he didn't kill all of you, despite his best efforts. An absolutely out front, drooling exterminationist mentality. That's what I'm up against. But that's what Indians have been up against all along. It's about time it got brought out in public view. And they're doing that big time. But let's go to the spin on this Indian business. Who the hell's business is it who my grandmother was? other than my grandmother's, mine, my family's, and the people that accept me as being one of them and have said so, repeatedly said so, taken me and put me in their roles as well as their society kind of said so, asked me to come and join them, vetted my genealogy because they wanted to know who I was. That's been done, and they've said it's been done. And not only me, but they, have been mercilessly misrepresented ever since. Let me take it by the numbers. I am not, nor have I ever been, an honorary member of the Kadua Band of Cherokee like Bill Clinton. <laughs> honorary membership is what it sounds like. It's an honorific that's bestowed on someone who provides a service or demonstrates cordiality or who is respected, and they say, we feel like you're one of us. You're not, but we honor you with that relation. I'm an associate member of the Kutua Band, not a full member, never said anything else. Let me explain the difference to you because this is the actual status and this is what the band's been trying to tell the media for weeks. I am of Cherokee descent, demonstrably so according to the standards set by the federal government of the United States in defining in Indianness, which is something called blood quantum, how much part Indian are you? Hey, Brennan, you here? Good as Irish reporter that thrives on this. Wanted to have an in-depth interview about it. I said I'd be glad to have this one-on-one -on -one interview with you, provided you show up with documentation of your Irish ancestry. <laughs> oh, I get your point, he says, and then goes right ahead and writes the stuff. Kevin Flynn in Denver as well. Same thing. Well, the British burned our papers. Yeah. Suppose there's a lesson there. Yeah, I get your point. Goes right ahead and writes the stuff. White guys, all preoccupied with the nature of identity in order to nullify and discredit. You can't get to the message, get to the messenger. I'm less than a quarter blood. Never argued any different. I claim to be a 16. That's all I've ever claimed. They said I might be as high as 3 16s. 
doesn't make me either a 16th less or a 16th more than John Ross, who's the greatest resistance patriot in Cherokee history, who in 1830 was one eighth Cherokee. Given our history, given the nature of our interactions, that's a perfectly respectable pedigree for us. And I can give a damn what the rest of society wants to think about it. We define who we are. My grandfather, mother defines who I am. My elders define who I am. White journalists don't. So we start there. Full members are more than a quarter blood. They hold office. They vote for those who hold office. They receive certain benefits on the basis of that particular status. Health benefits, for example, educational benefits. I don't receive any of those, don't need to. No reason why I should. Nor is there reason, any particular reason why I should be holding office in a Kutua band. I don't live in eastern Oklahoma. Why would I be a tribal council member? absurd on its face, and if I'm not going to be it and I'm not affected on the ground in the living of my day-to-day -day life, why <laughs> would I be voting on what the policy is going to be in those counties where the Katuas reside? No, I do other things, other things like this, which is why I'm one of them or self-identification, or community recognition, both of which are matters of federal law. The only thing left is the actual certificate or degree of Indian blood. Oh yeah, that's an actual legal document. You know of another population group anywhere on this continent that carries around like a poodle? A pedigree slip issued by the government. That's the expectation. In their own reportage, they got me identifying myself as native in a native hostile area of the country right down the road in central Illinois, where it's not exactly a popular thing to be in the 1950s and 60s. Since I was 10 years old identifying myself as being native, why would I do that? Well, it was this really forward-looking plot to take advantage of affirmative action to get this unfair entry into a professorship at the University of Colorado in 1978. That's why when I was a 10-year-old in 1958, I would have been doing that. Don't you know? <laughs> Alternate explanation. It's a little boy wandering around in central Illinois saying who he thinks he is because that's who his grandmother told him he was. And that's called self-identification. You want to check on community recognition, you get on C-SPAN. And you check that speech at the University of Colorado, and that's not a new event. That's been that way since 1980. So what's this about? This is about racism, pure and simple. When you all are required to walk around with your certificate degree of Swedish blood, German blood, Irish blood, Vietnamese blood, Igbo blood, Zulu blood, Bantu blood, to know who you are. When you're required, it'll be something perhaps other than racist, but I'd say that would be even more racist. Now it's just a particularly virulent strain of racism that is visited upon Indians and used to the advantage of non-Indians to manipulate the nature of our polity and our articulation. It's a matter of subjugation. If I can name you, if I can define you, I have absolute control over you. That's the nature of the focus of the media in one part, or whether it was six books, one writing award, I might have been a 10-year-old boy in a professor's position with 10 years teaching experience to boot, absent a self-identification on an affirmative action slip, distort the issue and undermine it, make the issue go away by focusing on the one who brings the issue up. Oh, yeah. I plagiarized myself. And two scholars have interpretive differences on two footnotes in that mass of literature I was talking about. Keeps coming out. Two scholars have said that there are problems with his scholarship. 200, including Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn, and others, 
have said something rather different. They somehow or another never managed to get quoted. So we have Thomas Brown. Somebody want to tell me what Thomas Brown is known for? Give me his major work. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> and John Lavelle, a devout political enemy coming out of another political grouping in the Indian community who has a different interpretation of the effects of the General Allotment Act. That's the big two. Up against we put the two if you want. Somehow or another the two keep getting press play. Noam Chomsky was quoted once and has disappeared from the newsprint altogether. And oh yeah, oh yeah. Churchill ripped off Thomas Mayles for an image. Well, actually, I did a couple more, too. And Tom Mayles knew it, OK, because those were not ripped off. They were adapted and interpreted to what I do, which was not what he was doing. He was making drawings. I do colorism. But here's the hot news flash. We're probably on to a conspiracy about the scope of the Illuminati now, because did you know that Jasper Johns painted the American flag, but he was not the original designer? Did you know, know that Marcel Duchamp did not invent the urinal? <laughs> did you know that Andy Warhol did not conceive of the layouts on Campbell's soup cans and Brillo boxes? And where was the outrage? Old objective reporters in the back. When Fritz Scholder took one of the most famous images of the American West, which was the Anheuser-Busch image of Custer's Last Stand and did a knockoff interpretation of that. This is, if you knew anything about it, which I suspect some of you do, such common practice that it would be unworthy of remark in any context. But let's assume for a moment that in my savage lack of integrity as a scholar, I actually did set out to rip Tom Mayles off. It seems rather unlikely on its face, don't you think, that I probably wouldn't have talked to him about it first? And then I would not have selected an image out of what was probably the best-selling book of its type for the entire period in which the work was done. Couldn't put it much more public than that. And if I was going to do that ripoff of that image from that perfectly accessible volume, I probably would have done it with a one-off painting rather than publishing an edition of the print 150 times over so it could be in full public view for the past quarter century. And by the way, why are you so slow? If that's breaking news, why did it take you a quarter century to figure it out? But this is the sort of thing that happens when someone gets up and speaks counter to the status quo and attempts to call things by their right name. They get that kind of spin, and it is monolithic. There has not been a break, and it is not reportage. It is, let's call it by its right name, propaganda. It is worthy of Joseph Goebbels. You don't have a propaganda ministry issuing you orders, although, as I understand it from the Denver press, you have editorial boards with vested positions that you're having to hew the line to. I understand that. But if you've got any integrity, if you've got any standards, stop talking about mine and get busy correcting the faults of your own profession. Return to the issues and come to grips with it. You got the capacity. Now do you have the guts and do you have the integrity to stand on what it is that you've been reviling me about? Stop treating this issue as an extension of how Indians have always been treated, either out of sight or out of mind, or reviled and treated as something we aren't and could never be. Are you prepared to turn your profession into pursuit of truth, or are you simply going to adhere to the line that's put forth by your employers in the interest of power and preservation of the status quo. You answer it. Sit there smirking. Sit there smiling. Sit there smirking. But it's on you now. It's on you now and on you for real, on all your major networks that never show up to hear about 
the devastation of other peoples with your fancy preoccupation with a segment of 3,000 Americans, the only people who count. When America's news media reflects the sensibility of the population or the population compels the news media to reflect its sensibilities in such a way as you understand that those brown babies over there count just as much as these white babies over here, that the white baby over here doesn't count a bit more than the black baby over here too, or the brown baby, or the yellow baby, or the red baby, that we all have value and are entitled to that human face. When that becomes a sensibility, when that is what is taught in the classroom, when that is what comes out in the media, we will actually have a basis for eliminating what it was that occurred on 911. But until that becomes the operant reality, you can kiss that prospect goodbye and permanently so, Dr. Yossi.